this there's no organization for plan today. Um, everybody gets to participate at the level they wish. And um, I came with no real agenda. I could uh, talk about Carl for quite a while, but I don't see a need for it. Most of the people here know him by reputation, if not by in person. He was a common uh, fixture at EE380. And so <clears throat> I think that what we should do is just talk a little bit about Carl and his uh, his contributions, what it is that he, he actually did. And if there are students in our audience, which there should be, um, if you have questions about Carl and what his contributions were, ask them of this group because these people know. <laughs> Well, I came with a question, but I don't know if I should it's your start question. it off. You're the one to start it off on. Carl had this very simple three line proof that purportedly um, contradicted one of Gödel's theorems, the one about um, mathematics not being able to prove its consistency. And this proof proved mathematics consistency. And I wonder if anybody has any, I, had any ideas about that, uh, what they think about it, uh, do they believe it? Oh, we all know uh, we can prove anything if we the, have the right let me, assumption. Let me, hold on. Yes. Uh, do they believe it? Do If they do, do what is the significance of it? Or uh, you know, how, how to understand it. Okay, yeah, go well, ahead. Well, the, uh, comment that, the comment I was making is that you can prove anything if you have the right assumptions. Okay. What is the proof? I was afraid somebody's going to ask me that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's in his book. Uh, I always forget it every time I hear it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, I don't know. Dennis, do you know it by heart? No, I don't. It's something like this, but I'm afraid I might make a mistake. It's something like, uh, it's proof by contradiction. So if you want to prove that uh, mathematics uh, proves its own consistency, then you assume that it doesn't prove its own consistency. And then you, at the end, and then you have another line, and I forget what that is, and at the end you have P and not P, which is false, which means the premise is proved. It's, it goes something like that, but I might, I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving things out and I'm not a logician, but it's in the, uh, his book, the uh, Inconsistency Robustness book. Well, I, to paraphrase uh, John McCarthy, I'm in no position to call his bluff. <laughs> 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 but I did, I did uh, uh, go to a seminar where he talked about that kind of thing and I, remember arguing against uh, some things he did and he argued back and I wasn't convinced by his argument but now I don't remember what the uh, what the details were but I don't remember anyone ever uh, ever saying oh I understand it and he's right yeah I, I he explained it several times in the Fryam sessions um, his, his I, the point I took was that um, <laughs> the logic system, has to accept P and not P. And if it does, then you can prove that mathematics is consistent. And so I, he was saying that, that Gödel's uh, premises were incomplete. Now, that's as much understanding as I have of it. Well, I, I, think I, I, I am reminded of John Rushby's proofs of the existence of God or, or the non-existence of God. And uh, you can prove anything if you, if you set it up right. Uh, he also uh, used, or he he also proved in addition to that, that um, the Russell's the uh, Russell's paradox uh, sentence, the uh, I am not a proof or whatever the sentence is that Kirtle used, uh, could not be should not be allowed. The yeah, self-referential the self-referential sentence okay. uh, cannot be allowed because it jumps levels basically. Right. He was, he was always, I think he, as I recall, he connected it to second order logic. The first order right. logic is not sufficient. 
Right. That is Something correct. like that. So does anybody believe the proof? He never convinced me, but he was so much smarter. I, I really couldn't argue with him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think um, I think he convinced me that he was onto something, but I think that so much of mathematics depends upon uh, things that he was perfectly willing to toss out on the uh, uh, out of the uh, hamper. Um, maybe we need to rethink things and refine definitions a little bit before we go. Uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I think he didn't accept Tarski and semantics. So uh, what he meant by validity might be different from what logicians uh, would take to be well, that's true. validity. <clears throat> Carl had a habit of using terminology to mean something other than what everybody else thought it meant. <laughs> And maybe everybody else didn't have a consistent view of what it meant. That's probably true, too. But the nice part about Carl attending the Friday meeting was we had two hours when we were meeting physically of in the room, uh, being able to question him in detail and push him on the details. So we may have gotten a more coherent explanation than many. Um, I don't know that the any of us fully understood him on many of these points, but uh, we did have the opportunity. Well, he tried out quite a few new ideas on us, and I thought that was uh, always interesting. Um, I found myself arguing with him on various uh, issues, but it usually was usually definitional because his definitions were, were a little bit awkwardly different from what everybody else thought was uh, the way it was done. And I keep coming back to my earlier remark. You can always prove almost anything if you have the right set of assumptions, which may be false. <laughs> well, I think in the book, he argues how his assumptions are all pretty standard. Because I looked it up this morning. <laughs> it, it, I mean, I don't know that they are, but he states that, you know, I make this assumption and that's pretty, you know, and he has some references and, and it's pretty well understood that this is it and, and, and it's this assumption, and this is kind of standard and that's standard. So he does make, he does try to make a case that the definitions and assumptions he's using are, are kind of standard and, and uh, wide, widely uh, used. To some extent, I thought he lived within his own virtual logical reality. Um, so he, he, he did bend things a little bit here and there. He had his own distortion field. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? Well, well, most of us live in our own virtual realities. That's not a surprise. Yeah. And sometimes we do it subconsciously without knowing that we're doing it. But I think the important thing was uh, Carl was trying to um, solve deep problems, and he wasn't afraid of criticism. Yeah, people didn't understand him. He didn't get angry. He just explained more. Now the explanation may not have been any better than the original one, but he kept trying. He seemed to have infinite patience with people who didn't get what he was talking about. And, and even people with no credentials like me. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have no training in computer science. My background, I have a PhD in astronomy. I, I tell people I learned computer science the way I learned about sex on the street corner from my friends. And Carl, <laughs> and, and Carl, Carl was always very patient with me. And uh, he was always trying to fill in the gaps in my knowledge so that I could understand it better. He definitely was not a snob. You know, if I said something stupid, he didn't just walk away from me. He, he uh, explained why I was wrong and then continued with his um, incomprehensible descriptions. Yeah. Where, where did you, where were you um, in contact with him? At the Fryer meeting. 
So I am. Okay. Yeah, for several several years, I don't know, three or four years at least, he was a regular attendee. Yeah, and he always had a paper that he was about to give, and he wanted to, to do a dry run on it. Right. Right. He didn't often did that. And we always told him his slides had too many colors and too many fonts. You know, uh, I always yeah. told him that. I told him that he made everything too bright and too sharp and 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 you know it was it was distracting. Yes. He should simplify it. And yes. I told him over and over and over again, and he didn't take it into account. He That's he right. was like incapable of getting rid of all these blaring colors and fonts and but he, and squiggles and squaggles. But he, he often asked me to review his slides, and um, yep. I, I um, am very careful about the flow, the story I'm telling. A talk is a story, and it has to flow. And um, he did take my suggestions on improving the flow on several of his talks, so I felt like I contributed something. He always gave me he gave me his slides too to review and. Uh, and sometimes he would tone down the fonts and the colors, but then in the next iteration, <laughs> it, they would be back. <laughs> I, I, I never, I never succeeded on fonts and colors, but I did get him to do some reorganization, so he was telling the story more clearly. I thought. Yeah, he had a habit of, of. I think there was specific feedback he was seeking on particular aspects of things, and he just sort of filtered out anything that wasn't that. <laughs> um, and he was very good at, at not listening to you. And I think that was part of uh, part of what let him focus on the sort of deep, deep abstraction. Not I, listening and making you think he is listening. Well, no, no. You, you could, it was like I, I had lots of wonderful arguments with him, um, both at Fryam and, and he, he when I was working at PayPal, he, he somehow developed the habit of inviting himself over for lunch you know, every week or two, and uh, and we and then I'd end up spending the afternoon arguing, <laughs> intact or something with him, and and it was like if if the thing that you were focusing on was the thing that he was focusing on, then you could have these amazingly fruitful conversations, and if the thing that he was focusing on was something and you were seeing some other thing off to the side, he it would just be like he just wouldn't hear you. Focus. <laughs> I remember one talk he gave where I uh, asked a question about one of the axioms. I thought it was uh, uh, different from one of his earlier axioms, and he changed it on the slide with that. <laughs> and I was, I, I wasn't actually saying it was wrong; just saying it could have been. I was ask, asking why why it was the way, but he just he just changed it without worrying about whether this. What this did to the rest of his system, he just uh, was uh, uh, That's accommodated. He didn't care about consistency, Richard. <laughs> he didn't mind. He didn't mind uh, inconsistency. <laughs> well, he he had this um, way of looking at long-standing problems in a completely different way. There's a um, a system where um, you're going to have several communicating um, components um, in this particular model called object capabilities. And uh, when they're distributed, there's a, a pretty standard way that's being been reinvented several times for getting controlling the way they talk to each other. And Carl came up with something that was completely different. And it took us forever I think I was one of the few people at Fryam who finally figured out what it was, where he was he was calling a type an actor. And, uh, uh, and you know, that is such a strange phrase that um, it threw a lot of people off. And it took me months going back and forth with him. And I did feed my explanation back to him. And he said, yes, that's it. I'm not convinced I was right yet, but... Uh, Maybe he was just trying to make me feel better. But I think that was characteristic of his career. Well, to be fair, didn't he introduce the term actor before uh, yeah. a lot of the absolutely. other stuff came along? Yeah, yeah. Well, for, for him, everything was an actor. Right. Or everything could be wheedled down to being an actor, like right. a plus sign or something. Two was an actor. Right. Two was an actor, right. I actually I actually used that in a, in a project. Um, 
uh, in small talk, two is an object. So in Carl's term, that's an actor. And I needed complex arithmetic. Ah. And I figured out how to send the message I to a number. So that oh, nice. Yes, that was it was a small talk pun, I thought. That's so, very nice. Yeah. And so the two was an actor, so I could send it a message. Um Paul, you got your hand up. So uh, changing the subject slightly, who all remembers uh Carl's belt pack, particularly in the 80s? Sure. That, that Carl, I think, qualifies as the original EDC guy. So for the uninitiated, EDC is everyday carry. And the very first time I met Carl, it was at some, some nerd soiree in Monterey Bay. And he proudly showed, I think it might have even been a uh, an Asilomar event. He proudly showed me his belt pack that included 120 feet of piano wire in case he needed to evac out of the third story of a building. It wasn't clear to me whether he actually had a descending device or if he was gonna wear gloves. <laughs> um, but I remember being much taken by, you know, the 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 forethought and and sheer nerdy practicality of Carl. It wasn't just bits. He was he was gonna make himself safe in a world of atoms too. Well he also carried a suitcase around with him uh, on on wheels. That, that was late, that was later when well, I guess the computing equipment got to be heavier and heavier. Mm -hmm. So what was in it, Peter? Do you remember? Well, sometimes he opened it up and pulled out papers, and sometimes it was a computer, sometimes it was other things. Lunch. They had this huge old uh, MacBook Pro. I, mean, I think it was a seventeen-inch screen. It must have weighed. It looked like you know the old uh, early uh, portables that you know the luggables with the handle on it. It was that big. Um, so he wasn't going to be carrying that very far. But yeah, he had tons of papers in there. Always nice to have a big screen. Yes, you had to have that big screen. He wasn't going to replace that machine. He wasn't good at garbage collection. Now, in, in the early days at MIT, he always had a key ring with must have been 20 or 30 keys on it. Did, did he continue with that throughout yep, his life? Absolutely. <laughs> always had this gigantic key ring. I yeah. think most of those keys, he didn't know what they were anymore, and they didn't work. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, he was probably afraid to throw any of them out. <laughs> yeah, just in case. Right, exactly. But this was before uh, people had master keys. So he figured, you know, anybody that had a lot of keys was an important person. Mm -hmm. That was before master keys. Now the important person has only one key. One <laughs> like key at MIT. Overall. That opens all the doors. <laughs> well, I remember Paul, I remember uh, Carl when he uh, got his first uh, Newton and was running around showing how paragraph converted perfectly ordinary text into haiku. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it was it was quite amazing. Uh, the Newton, of course, was a much nicer machine than we'd all admit today. But it was. It was yeah, I remember, I remember he told me he showed me his Newton and said, "Someday you're going to have one of these in your future." You know that uh, uh, basically everyone was going to be have, carrying around uh, uh, a computer. And of course, he was right. But I didn't uh, take it very seriously. Well, He's right. I got four of them in my basement, including um, uh, one of the Siemens Newton desk phones. It had a little, you know, telephone handle and a docking station and stuff. So, yeah. as usual, he predicted it. Well, in the love, last, he did love those gadgets. I kept running into him at the Samsung Developer Conference at Moscone, where he seemed very interested in the Tizen operating system which was Samsung's proprietary version of Linux, as I recall. And he was full of derision for the way that system, you know, details of some Linux version. You know, I think of Linux as, as being roughly similar to each other, but he seemed to uh, revel in the fine points of that specific thing. I think he may have been going because there were these giveaways, you know, <laughs> if you... If you registered as a faculty, they would give you 
like a watch or something like that. And he liked the gadgets. So in his last yeah. few years, Carl uh, was uh, uh, continually talking about the HoloLens, the Microsoft HoloLens, and how we'd all be wearing these smart glasses and um, how that would be um, everything. And, uh, you know, we, we, we didn't believe him, but maybe it's like we didn't believe him about the Newton. And in a few more years, we'll all be wearing HoloLens. Well, the HoloLens isn't going to catch on until they uh, sell it, you know, with the package, including some white surgical tape so people can tape the uh, bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have memories of him as an undergrad at MIT? Did he do the steam tunnel thing? Tell us about the steam tunnel thing. Uh, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't smart enough to go to MIT. I went to uh, a college down the road a ways in Cambridge. Um, and and we we had our version of, of steam tunnels. And there were basically at Harvard, there were only uh, two things that would get you expelled from Harvard. One was aggravated assault or murder. And the other was getting caught in the Harvard steam tunnels. And we were all in awe of the MIT undergrads because they had clearly done a much better job of mapping all the hidden steam tunnels and passages under the university than we had. And he just struck me with his little everyday carry kit. I figured he must have been in the thick of that. No, I met Carl, I think his last year's graduate student. That was my first year in the AI lab. Okay. So I didn't know him as an undergrad. Well, I have, a question. I have a question for you. Did did Carl have the same laugh back then that he did? Oh yes. <gasps> I can't do it justice, but he did have <laughs> he did have that very distinctive laugh. Very much so. I think there should be a panel uh, where all all the speakers have uh, unusual laughs. It, only not only we shouldn't tell them why they were invited to be on this <laughs> like the python department of funny walks uh yeah the same sort of thing for but for the ass <laughs> you know i was i've been giving some thought to what i could say about carl under this these circumstances because you know carl and i were intellectually very opposed to each other but I, something that I can say appreciatively is although Carl and I disagreed on almost any technical point you could imagine, unlike some of the other people in the AI lab at the time, he never made any attempt to obstruct me getting my degrees. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think um, Carl took criticism of his work um, as personally as many as as many have. I know um, he uh, he told us tales of uh, uh, what went on in MIT with actors versus scheme versus uh, uh, several of the other proposals, but uh, um, he never struck me as being bitter about the disagreements. That's what oh, I that's. That. But he never forgot them. No. He gets. <laughs> right. That's like, the I'm... way he would he would hand me papers and say, you know, that I was supposed to criticize everything I could find. That was my job for a while. Well, anyway, I mean, go ahead. And I interrupt. I was going to say I was when I was at MIT working on my bachelor's thesis in 1978. So I'd have to work the evening shift to get a terminal. And Carl would just wander in at some point and start telling me something that was interesting. And we had a great talk. I don't know why he picked me out. You know, I mean, I think he was kind of going down the hall to see who was there. Uh, and I also remember this fight. I remember, yeah, I remember, you know, he and Jerry had opposing viewpoints, but Jerry was the one who was very, very angry. And Carl managed to avoid that which is what uh, somebody else just said, that he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't feel like he had to correct something right away, that it was wrong and you had to tell everybody, which I appreciated. 
it was laconic, what I might say in that regard. So I've always had a question. Why why did Carl leave MIT? I think you're probably in the best position to answer that. It's complicated. Oh, come on. It's not being recorded. It is being recorded. <laughs> it is being recorded, so you want to be careful. And we have a reporter here, too. Do no, we? he's an ex-reporter. Where, where's the reporter? I guess retired. Yourself. Retired. <laughs> oh, it's clear Carl wanted someplace sunnier. Uh, let's just say. Actually, he's dead if you can believe ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> let's just saying? say he had a difference of opinion with some powers that be. I would have not been surprised at that. Uh, McCarthy did as well, and he came out to Stanford in the 60s. A power that be made that made life difficult for him. Huh. Well, it was our game. But then, uh, you know, I, I always wanted him to move to California because I had moved from California to live with him in Boston because I met him out here. Uh, but then when he finally, I quoted, got divorced from MIT, he overshot and went to Hawaii for a couple of years. Hmm. Really? Uh, yeah. Who was, who was yeah. he working with in Hawaii? Oh, he was trying to interest the University of Hawaii to do some of his work, but he could never get any traction with that. I don't think there was anybody there. I, I remember Frank Quo and, and the chairman of the department, who was one of the great uh, early... Eric correcting uh, what Peterson was Peterson. I, I gave a, a ACM lecture out there, spent a week out there, had a wonderful time. Peter, hadn't, hadn't Frank Quo moved to SRI by the time Carl left MIT? Uh, sorry, what was that question? Hadn't Frank Quo moved to SRI? Oh, Frank Quo Carl Frank Quo was, MIT. He was at Bell Labs with me. Oh. And then he went to Hawaii. Uh, with Norm Abramson and and all of that, uh, um, uh, uh, the the network stuff that they developed. But Frank went, Frank moved to and SRI. Then, and then, then, he, then he left uh, there and, and went to SRI for a bunch of years. Yeah, but I think he, I think he was at SRI when when. That was much later. Carl left MIT. Yeah, that, I th I think he was uh, no, I think he'd already been at Hawaii. Right, but I, I'm saying I don't think Carl would have moved to Hawaii to work with Frank because Frank was already gone. Yeah, but I don't think I, I think whether he was or not, I don't think he would have gone to work with Frank. Frank. Anyway, he became Frank's enamored already. with MIT because he had had a year sabbatical in Japan. So, somebody in Japan invited him to uh, <clears throat> World. To some, yeah, to some institute to be there for a year. And uh, in going back and forth between Japan and Boston, he would spend some time in Hawaii. So then he decided once he left MIT that he wanted to go to Hawaii because they had warm water there. Even he though did, I, want, he, I wanted him did, to move uh, to California. He did windsurfing. Uh, he did windsurfing and snorkeling and various things. So, he bought a house that ended up being too expensive, and he fixed it up and sold it. So I want to encourage you to join in here. You must know all sorts of stories, but you're on mute. No, I'll unmute. Um, not you... stories, but I do have some questions. Um, I would routinely run into Carl around Stanford over a number of years, and he would always tell me stories that were vaguely sinister, that involved national security things and the Chinese and the FBI. Mm -hmm. And I <laughs> never quite got to the bottom of anything. They were always <laughs> incredibly entertaining. And, you know, as a reporter, um, it was, uh, you know, it was like, um, it was catnip. But I never got anywhere with any of it. And it left me wondering about his relationship to national security, if there was anything at all. Well, you know, he spent a lot of time telling stories about uh, what seemed to be inside national security stories. 
Uh, some of them were, were I, I discovered later were public, and, and others were uh, less so. Uh, he may have had some friends in there that, that were tipping him off on something or other. But he, he, loved, he loved that kind of juicy uh, story to tell. Like no one else on this call. <laughs> <laughs> ah, funny, funny. <laughs> I also thought that he was a bit paranoid about such things. Oh, very much. But then no. again, I might be naive. No, 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 that's exactly right. I mean, he, he really was uh, uh, felt threatened by, by the NSA and, and the, uh, the FBI and, and other institutions, Department of Justice. Maybe that goes like along with the piano wire. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that goes along with the early in the 60s being anti-war, anti-Vietnam and protesting. Yeah. But the, the last national security thing I remember him talking about were these back doors on all our devices, on our oh, phones, computers. And yeah. he seemed to believe that it could be done securely. And we kept trying to talk him out of it, but I don't think we ever succeeded. And I, that I seems never, counter to got, yeah, the paranoia. I never, got, I never got traction on that argument. The, the standard story I tell is that if you can't trust the hardware, you can't trust the software. And if you can't trust the software, you can't trust the apps. Right, and uh, we've been working uh, heavily on what we can do to trust the hard this the hardware, yep. and I always always undermine his arguments and saying, "Look, but that's not true." If you, if you look at uh, the fact that you can't trust that hardware, um, there's no way you can protect you can guarantee that any software is is. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and and that's why I was surprised that he wasn't uh, worried about it. It seemed to run counter to his normal paranoia. I, well, he was not consistent. I mean, again, it, it, the, you can prove anything if you make the wrong assumptions. And I, I go back to my initial remarks uh, 40 minutes ago. Um, that, Do you hear that? And silence on the call, too. Well, and Peter, I just want to note on that consistency, like all of us on this call are completely consistent and totally coldly rational. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm consistent on a few things that I've been involved in since the 60s um, relating to trustworthy systems. True. And um, I haven't changed my tune very much. I was in a very awkward situation in the electronic voting thing uh, when I signed on to the letter that said there was no, uh, um, uh, no misgiving in, in the Obama election. Uh, I'm sorry, in the... Uh, uh, in the Biden election, uh, despite what Trump was saying. Uh, but I was also, uh, I just published the article in the ACM about uh, uh, the electronic computer systems have no audit trail, and that for the most part, they're not trustworthy. So I, I'm, I'm hung in the middle, but I've been consistent on both sides. So, <laughs> saying, saying that you can't trust the, the, uh, the voting machines. I've been doing that you're, since 1988. You're paraconsistent. That is, there are certain parts okay. of your framework that's consistent, another part that's consistent. But again, it depends on the assumptions you're making. Uh, the standard cryptography problem is, oh, we've got an absolutely 100% guaranteed uh, secure system. And then they put it on a Microsoft platform where the, the, the secret key is embedded into the uh, operating system. As, as a constant, uh, that's not very secure. So uh, again, it, it's a question of what assumptions are you making? But Carl, Carl you see, was always um, a little woolly about some of the assumptions. And you try to pin him down and, and uh, you discover your terminology was orthogonal to his. And that made it very difficult to argue with him because he was assuming things that, that I wasn't. You couldn't get down to axioms? Um, you try, you try, but uh, sometimes the axioms were descriptively vague. And so there's always the problem of trying to pin down something that's in words which is why we go to formal methods, for example. But even there, you don't know what the assumptions are that are being made, that you've just proved something is correct 
even if you have axioms that describe the hardware, uh, no one can uh, tell whether someone's changed the hardware so it doesn't satisfy the axiom anymore. That's right. We've got we've got um, the speculative execution and and the uh, the direct memory access problems with embedded microcontrollers that are proprietary and undocumented, made in China. You have no idea what the hell is going on in the hardware. So I I, just, a, lot of, a lot of this discussion about him, him uh, being uh, able to prove things about things that other people didn't think made any sense um, is, is again related to the assumptions that, that he was making. And yeah, he was wonderful to argue with because he, he argued incessantly about one thing or another. It's delightful to have a discourse with him. Did, did any has any did anyone ever succeed in convincing him he was wrong about something? I I had problems with that. I've got I got him to make small tweaks, but I never got him to say, "Oh no, that was wrong." No, I, I, I once I once convinced him he was he was wrong about something, and he acknowledged my you know alternative explanation for what he was talking about, and then he just went on after that as if this conversation had never happened it just basically did not deflect him at all it was it was it was quite funny i i got him to admit that he was wrong but it had more to do with personal things like interrupting me oh. before i was finished <laughs> he said he wasn't doing that well he agreed that that was not a good thing to do oh, oh good okay but just put, that just didn't before mean he'd he interrupt you again. again. Yeah, but is it, you're very lucky. You're very fortunate then, because that was. Oh, a I had to hard. train him on lots of things. Well, it so, was very hard to interrupt him when he was when he was on a on a rant. Well, but that's not really interruption. That's what's known as enthusiastic listening, <laughs> 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 or um, as uh, um, uh, oh, uh, or mansplaining. Mansplaining, but sometimes he would before I got a chance to explain or ask a question. This was the, the, the quintessential thing that I would get angry about is that I would want to ask a question, and he would he would start to answer it before I finished the question, thinking he knew what it was going to be, but he'd get it wrong sometimes. So sometimes. when sometimes what was his accuracy rate? Oh, I didn't keep track, but I hated it anyway because I got I want to get it out before. He, but anyway, he admitted that that was not a good thing to do. So every time I caught him in it, he would stop. Oh, I love it. Well, that's, Arno, that's Pensius. another form of speculative execution, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Arno, Arno Penzias likes to say that he he likes to listen with his mouth open. <laughs> that's not a good thing. By the way. You're not the only partner who complained about it. My wife let me have it many times over the exact same issue. Oh. Yeah, and there's statistics about that, that in groups that uh, men do more of the talking and women do less of the talking, and they think they do less of the talking and all this stuff. Yeah, but hey. there's some cultures which do this regularly, overlap. Bob? New York. New York. Ethnics. Yeah. Jews. Italian. People talking at the same time and they're both not listening to each other. So that's yeah, but you know, when true. I when I'm with my friends and they're talking over me, like I'm talking over you right now, sorry. Uh they're also listening. But Carl would get an idea in his head about what I was gonna say and he wouldn't change it un unless I, you know, I had to beat on him pretty hard. In that's order because his idea was better than yours. <laughs> Or That's what not. he would say, but no. sometimes my idea was better, and he would admit it. That's really weird for a guy. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I domesticated him. I made him a feminist, and he would admit that he was by the end. <laughs> Well, not when he was at MIT, I believe. I've heard. Oh, that's right. Well, he had to put up the front, you know. Uh, the misogynist front. <laughs> No, I, I've I've had him back down on things like in one lecture. I think he claimed that the an implication was not equivalent to its contrapositive, which is like basic propositional logic. And uh, I think uh, 
he uh, uh, eventually backed down on that when uh, I and other people uh, objected. Maybe he was right, but uh, we overruled him. Well, uh, just off the top of my head, it it wouldn't be equivalent in intuitionistic logic, would it? Um, I'm not sure about that. I, I think it might, it might still be because uh, you can't reduce not 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 p to p and in intuition. Right. That's logic. true. It isn't but, what it isn't, you know. Yeah. There you go, you computer scientists always talking above my head. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get into it. <laughs> so, Paul, are you not a computer scientist? No, I'm. 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 No, I'm. I'm not sure what I am, <laughs> but I'm most qualifiedly not a computer scientist. How would you identify yourself? Uh, I've been accused of being a futurist with the past. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And I'm I'm scab labor at Stanford. In fact, I've got a student conference call in 15 minutes, but so I shovel smoke for a living. I'm a parasite living off the intelligence of people like you all and Carl. Are you worried about chat GPT, Paul? I love it. I, you know, come on. I said to my students the first day of the quarter, I said, please, if you want to use chat GPT to do your papers, do so. Just let me know. Uh, list them as listed as co-author, and and you know <laughs> my my working hypothesis. I I know it's wrong, but you know I'm old enough to remember when everybody had their knickers in a knot over uh, the arrival of you know um, mathematical calculators in high school, and civilization didn't end with that. Um, so I figure you know at least mathematical calculators were generally correct. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't son, know about that. Um, and, they, and they didn't have a political bias. Yeah, my my son can't still can't do arithmetic without one. And you needed to use a reverse Polish in order to use them for a few years. Oh, hey, I mean, listen, guys, that's I use reverse Polish every day. <laughs> wow. Oh well, I still have mine as well. <laughs> I, uh, but I really use mine. And I, you know, for the, if I'm not doing heavy tasks, it's the 12 C. So, <laughs> Was that so no, I'm not a computer scientist, but, but I'm a nerd. Uh, it's a, uh, this, this one's the uh, 41 CV. Yeah. Uh, and then I have a CX. I, I, I buy them on eBay just to have a couple of round in case one breaks, but. Yeah. I use the web-based version for them, of them. Oh, that's depraved, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what do they cost? About ten bucks? Or uh, okay? It sort of depends. And I've got a full full set of all the IL peripherals that I never use. So if anybody is dying to have an IL printer and and tape storage, give me a call. Hey, I love that so much. I was uh, a sophomore in college, and I spent three hundred dollars. That that was you know like nineteen sixty six dollars. That was real Big money. money. But that was one of those. That was, I, I got news for you. That was not 1966. When I think that? the 41 came out in, I want to say, 73 or 74. They were 35. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got a 35 and 67 yeah. and a bunch of others. And, and I'm at that point where I got to get this crap out of my life. So if anybody wants to. Well, so, well, so, Paul, so Paul, was... should, should we invest in futures? <laughs> <It's> invest in futures. <laughs> hey, you know. Yogi Berra, the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> Actually, on a serious note, it's something I would have loved to talk to Carl about is, uh, you know, thanks to the recent crypto meltdown, it's being exposed that there, uh, I, I think I heard the term future bros, and that everybody's now slamming the idea of long-term responsibility because twits like Peter Thiel and, uh, and Nick Bostrom are giving it a bad name, and and stuff. So maybe don't invest in futures. I have a question for did, did, did Carl have some interaction with the philosophy community? Uh, we started CSLI and then shortly after that, or I don't know, Carl would come over and we'd go to office to office to talk to people. And um, he and I really got along, I think, because I was the, about the only one over there 
that that would listen to him when he started saying Girdle was wrong. Uh, <laughs> it, it really didn't go over well with uh, the logicians and the philosophers, but I don't know, it seemed something I was willing to think about. And I think that's mostly what we had in common. We, we met weekly for a couple of years, usually at Starbucks. And uh, well, our, I think our political opinions going back to the 60s, where we were both anti-war, were pretty similar. And, um, you know, just I was willing, I kind of just think philosophy went off the rails <laughs> a long time ago, but I don't, I don't know which rails it went off of. So uh, uh, Girdle, Girdle is wrong. Well, I mean, could be. Uh, and he was attracted to my stuff, not because he read it, understood it, and thought it was right, because it disagreed with people he thought should probably be disagreed with. <laughs> <laughs> I think the comparable uh, argument was that Newton was wrong. What's that? The comparable argument was that Newton was wrong. Yeah, well... Well, it, for, for the for the wrong reasons. I mean, Girdle yeah. may have been wrong, but again, it goes back to the assumptions that he was making. Yeah, but you know, Newton may have decided that uh, uh, weight wasn't basic, but at least he took on the project of explaining what it was. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to modern scientists who think time is unreal, but they don't. And never mind. Don't get me on it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Carl and I really enjoyed each other's company without my understanding his deep thoughts, but not rejecting them out of hand because they agreed with other established heroes. That's okay. Many of us feel the same way about you. Yes. He, uh, he would play along with my thoughts because I was disagreeing with a lot of people without, I think, ever... I remember one time we really got to the bottom of things, and he said, well, I forget, he didn't think there was any such thing as a thing or something like that. And at that point, I had to punt because, uh, but no, I, I don't know of anyone else in the philosophy department or even among the logicians that I knew that uh, he spent a lot of time with. But he and I spent a lot of time together. I really miss him. Uh, and <laughs> that that doesn't surprise me, but there is there is some some deep sense in which he was a philosopher, in the in the in the informal sense of the term, right? People on the street would if they talked to this guy, I mean, he was doing deep philosophical things. Yes, I I, I think that's right, and I think if I'd got to know him, uh, uh, when when he was younger and I was younger, uh, and we'd each lived about another hundred years. We we really might have come up with something, but um, even even David Israel, who's uh, most of you guys probably know, who's pretty um, pretty open minded. I, I he I couldn't convince him to join me and talk to <laughs> talk talk to him. So I don't know, but he goes down in my book as one of the most interesting people I knew. And and he used to hang out around a lot at Hoover Tower, and uh, it gave me the impression that he was getting all kinds of inside information about China and stuff from them. And I wouldn't say I believed him, but I didn't really disbelieve him. Uh, well, nobody at Hoover has any clue about China, but yeah, well, <laughs> there, is, there is there is that. <laughs> I apologize. I got to sign off and do a student call. I'm thrilled this is recorded. And Dennis, just uh, a modest suggestion. This is a group that should get together more than on an occasion like this. Just, I've heard some wonderful not, things in the last three years. As a no bit. We're, yes. um, we're scheduled to have several of these over the year because uh, of other uh, uh, sad events. And uh, we'll see everybody have the opportunity to come in and chat about this sort of thing, because these people that we're losing are people that touched all of our lives. Well, let's this not just do it when people are disappearing. Yeah, this is very true. Are you still on? Yep. I wanted to go back to the issue that everything is an actor. Mm -hmm. And you and I have been involved with other people on capability-based architectures for years. 
Um, he would always look as, on everything as if it had been solved long ago in, in the actor space. Uh, when there were details of implementation that uh, were certainly uh, not raised by his model. Yeah, um, there's a guy, uh, Dale Schumacher, that I referred you to at one point, who has a, a, a blog and it's titled Act Actors All the Way Down, and he does it all the way down to the hardware. Mm -hmm. So um, we can talk offline. Yeah, separately. Okay. okay. Uh, and I spent... Uh, a dozen years wow. or more um, implementing actors for Carl. I worked for him at, uh, I was a research scientist at the MIT AI lab. So uh, I can address any questions you have <laughs> about that, Peter. Yeah. Okay. And Dale uh, worked with Carl for a while trying to implement his new language, actor script, but never could get a clean enough definition to finish the implementation. Yeah, but I implemented um, actors on Lisp machines uh, yeah. connected by Ethernet. So right. we had a fully distributed actor implementation, and everything was an actor. Right. So uh, we were able to, you know, I, w I think actors are still the absolute best way of thinking about parallel and distributed computation. I, I actually had to reinvent them to I, uh, get my work done. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think it's, the trends in 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 parallel computing and distributed computing, I think, are now kind of vindicating a lot of what uh, what Carl had to say about those those ideas. Right. And plus, and, they have very interesting security properties in addition to the computational properties. Uh, has anyone yeah. written up the history of that, or you know, a retrospective uh, analysis of of the early actor work and how and and its implications for for the future? Uh, well, I, I no, I mean, I could write something of a retrospective. The, I did write, um, for the implementation that I did, um, I did write a kind of pretty comprehensive uh, uh, <clears throat> a paper about it that wound up in a book about object-oriented programming. Um, I, there were uh, two papers that I then, that, uh, that uh, uh, so I could send you that or, um, well, I was or, just more interested in, in, in making sure that the crawl's ideas get, get out there. And, and yeah. I mean, the kind, this is the kind yep. of thing that should appear in CACM, right. As a, as a review yeah. article of, on his contribution uh, on the, on the actor framework and, and, yeah. and how it, it get, at least I, I don't understand it myself very well, but it sounds like it has potential solutions to a lot of outstanding issues. Yep. Yep. I mean, I'll, th I'll think about it for anybody else who would want to collaborate on such a thing. I'd be willing to think about that. But yes, I think. And, and you know, some of his ideas did make it out into contemporary um, parallel systems or, you know, his students fanned out and went to work for Microsoft and other companies. And um, some of those ideas did make it into modern uh, things. And then there's um, one of, you know, I worked with Carl. Uh, we published in 1983 a paper on real the first real-time garbage collection algorithm, and that is really virtually on every, literally on every computer in the world, in some form or another, you know, in the operating system or in one of the programming languages. So Carl has had enormous influence, and I think as parallel co and distributed computing become more popular, that will continue to happen. But I, I found uh, Carl's early paper, 73 paper on actors, I found it incomprehensible. At the very least, it's a very hard slog. Ooh. So a, a yep. better written explanation would, would be of great. Yeah. Value. So from the, you know, for the, there's Gulaga's book, you know, that's one source. Um, but again, I'd be happy to share uh, with the, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat. Yeah, Carl, Carl um, tried to explain to me the differences between his thinking and Gul's Aga's thinking. And uh, when I read Gulaga's book, I could see there, there was a difference there. So I'd like to get a coherent explanation of Carl's thinking on, on actors. I'd also be interested yeah. in how it changed over the, over the years from 73 on. Yeah. Um, now, he, of course, was, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, now, of course, you know, uh, my, in my writing, it was the best understanding that I had. But of course, you know, 
there might have been differences between Carl and me or between me and you know the two of us in Gulaga. Uh, but I think that the idea, I think, and let me just say a word about this bit about you know everything being an actor. I mean, for years and years, people thought, oh, that's ridiculous. You mean to tell me that two is an actor when it's just a couple of bits, you know? But I think that's a very, very profound idea. And the only two formalisms that really have gotten that down correctly that I know of are actors and small talk. And outside of that, you know, all the objects in Python and C++ and all the other languages that have tried to have object-oriented programming, so-called, they don't have that. They just add some notion of objects onto a more uh, conventional bit <laughs> representations. And the problem with that is that you can't have things like futures. You know, future depends on being able to have total transparency between an object that's computed in parallel and an object that's computed in, in serial, an object computed remotely and an object computed locally. The big thing about having everything be an actor is that that made the issues of parallel and distributed computing transparent. And I think that was really profound. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what about quantum computing? Is that uh, an actor problem? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know enough personally about quantum computing to be able to say whether how it would fit in that category. But uh, you know, if I knew more about quantum computing, and I was also worried about your earlier comment where you said you the actors can go down to the ion level. Uh, it seems to me it, it, you, you can't really model the hardware. Well, in the implementation, I had the idea of what was called, and I explained this in the paper, called a, a rock bottom actor, which is an actor that is represented by whatever the machine representation is. So if it's the number two, then yeah, it is just a couple of bits. But the idea of having the, and the interpreter checks for rock bottom actors at each uh, you know, part of the interpreter cycle. So this, and if you do a, you know, and it knows where all the, the, the scripts for the rock bottom actors are. So, so you can sim, so it essentially means that in those cases, you can simulate having a full actor when in fact, you know, the machine just represents it quickly. So that's the, 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 the bottoming out of, of the formalism. And that was, it took some while to work out that out, make it work in all the cases, but I did make it work and it made a huge difference, I think, in the system. Were there, were there versions yeah. of the actor framework where you could have different levels of abstraction so you could treat something that was not truly primitive, treat it as primitive for purposes of, you know, for now, and then later if you needed to, to expand it? Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, we had mechanisms and, you know, you could unpack different layers of the implementation. So you had to go a little bit below what we would call the user level uh, or the pro developer level uh, for something like that, you know, but, um, but it was possible. And, in, you know, in our case, the underlying implementation uh, language was Lisp. So, you know, we inherited kind of the objectness of Lisp there. Okay, I think we're running out of time. Yeah, I think that's true. Well, I, I just like to say it's great seeing some of you who I haven't seen literally in decades, like, so. Uh, it's it's great catching up with you. It's uh, too bad it has to be on such a sad occasion. I think I think uh, he was a, a unique individual in in many ways, um, and he looked at things almost everything differently from everybody else. And therein lies some of the discussions that we've been having, where there, there were potential disagreements that may or may not have been disagreements. We don't know, really. And, and, <laughs> and you, couldn't, you couldn't pin him down enough to, to figure out what, what was really going on. Yeah, I just want to know for, uh, I just put in the, um, I just put in the chat uh, <clears throat> to my paper for those who are interested. Uh, I want to thank you for in inviting me. <laughs> Give me a little bit perspective on this guy I became great friends with without ever knowing what the F he was talking about. Uh, 
<laughs> he, he did give me a tremendous amount of reprints. <laughs> so to keep our conversations going, I'd search, search for two or three sentences that I understood, and that was usually enough to get started the next time. And I want to apologize for not asking you if it was okay to smoke. I should have done that. <laughs> that comment reminds me of something you once said to me probably 40 years ago. If you're assigned to comment on a long paper and you don't understand anything past page three, it's a good idea to find serious problems on page one. <laughs> yeah, well, but I'm a great teacher for people like me that don't really understand all that much of what they read. <laughs> but bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you again and, and some others. Okay. Okay. I want to say one more thing though before, before everybody goes. Um the um uh the source of all uh, active work that Carl was doing is he, he was he was a prolific writer and everything came in uh, versions so you get the 121st or 122nd <laughs> version of a particular paper uh, he also used the archive services like archivex and uh, hal very heavily and <laughs> you know he, to this day there are copies of his earlier papers in various forms in the archives and, if you're looking to see what work he has been doing or had been doing, that's a good place to start. Anyhow, thank you all for coming.